there's a way to make an entrance. <laughs> My destiny. It was now a conspiracy of witches. Download Veely today. My name is Grayson Perry, and I'm an artist, a husband, a father, and a man. What's a real man, anybody's on an answer to that. <laughs> Men have tended to rule the world, and in many ways, we still do. There's a degree of being a, war a warrior prophet. But I think we're a stranger, a more interesting bunch than we let on. <laughs> you think it's weird in Wigan? Yeah, just all different places. Really? I've been dressing up as a woman since I was 12 years old, and uh, so I've kind of been forced to look at gender. And I feel, that even though I'm quite masculine, transvestism has given me enough distance that I can turn round and look at that tower of power that is masculinity. In this series, I'm going to put myself into three of the most ultra-male worlds I can find. Hi, yeah, I'm Grayson Perry, I'm an artist. We're just making a film about men, really. It takes a man to end the life. But I just wonder if there is a point where you think, I have enough money. I want to see what their extreme masculinity can tell us about all men today. But there must be a reason why a lot of men need to be tough. Why do they need to be tough? So you enjoyed the crash then? Oh, did it? I mean, it was a missed, marvellous time. Then I'm going to make art to try to capture what I experience. I don't think this work is my most subtle. <laughs> and show it to the people who inspired it. Thank you. Thank you for making it. Thirty on a July morning in Skelmersdale, Lancashire, and the first of a series of dawn raids. Um, it's a Section 23 warrant, uh, Misuse of Drugs Act, um, being authorised for our power of entry this morning. There's a group who are committing 85% of all crime. Now, going into property today, it is a drug step. They're behind 92% of drug-related offences. The key today is to get in there, get them gripped. They commit 96% of the muggings. All right, let's get out there and do it then. They also make up a similar proportion of the cops with me on this raid. That group is men. Thanks very much, everyone, for coming early morning. Is everybody happy where they're going to? Yeah, keep everybody safe and... Let's get out there. We're on the trail of a notorious local drug dealer called Gary Hot Dog and his gang. Operation Nemesis is about to begin. Two rival groups of males, cops and criminals, battling it out for control of a turf. And one artist, me, along for the ride, on a slightly unconventional research trip to see how this extreme snapshot of man-on-man -man conflict can inform the art I'm going to make. to be targeted, a low-ranking member of the hot dog crew called Alan. Alan, have you scored this morning? No. No. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
It'll take fucking hours. What's your language? It'll take Most hours. Appropriate. Yeah, no, you can't swear once in your own home. It's great, that, is it? The squad I've been assigned to is led by Sergeant Billy Matthews. Once he had taken off the armour, we had a chance to talk about the raids. Want a coffee, Grace? Yeah, that'd be great. It's a good day, wasn't it? And for me, for me, it was quite sort of. I was quite upset by it actually. I felt, you know, I, I for me, for you, it's a normal day, I suppose. You know, going yeah. in and smashing someone's house down, door down, should I say? <laughs> but um, for me, it was quite troubling. You know, wandering into someone's private space like that uh, and standing over a guy in his boxer shorts being arrested. It's invading their human rights, isn't it? When you at the beginning, when I first joined the police, I was probably in the same shoes what you were in, but you do, you get used to it. But I obviously see what they've been up to, and you're just seeing us straight in with the door, you know, executing the warrants. Six addresses raided, five arrests, a successful morning's work. But even Sergeant Matthews and his squad seem uncertain how much difference it'll ultimately make. We're not going to be able to stop it. They'll never stop because these young kids will always take over. Yeah. Yeah, the kids that you're talking about, the sort of new generation of uh, criminals coming through, are going to be boys. They're not going to be girls. Why is it that boys and not girls are drawn into that? I think lads are naive, aren't they? Especially to the, like, the, you know, the alpha males out there. I think that they're, they're easy. I think they're easy exposed to go and do deal on drugs. You know, you don't usually see girls carrying knives, do you? I think it's more easy for the males. When they're in a group, you can feel ten foot taller, can't you? You can feel a lot taller than anyone else. So I think it's just proving themselves and they want to be... They want to have a reputation. Main, your main leaders, uh, and then your locals, and then you've got your, your generals, your lieutenants, and your work. It, it, and it does look like, like what I mentioned, uh, proving yourself to gain, you get, get up in the pecking order. What Operation Nemesis was revealing to me was a world not just of crime and squalor, but of hierarchy too. It was something the police clearly thought quite a bit about. I wondered if the men they were catching felt it too. Aaron had been brought in that morning, although he was later released without charge. Hi, Aaron. I'm Grayson. Hi. Uh, well, thanks for letting us speak to you, really, a lot. I asked him if he recognised the picture the cops had painted. You've got your low chain, you've got your shoplifters, burglars, then you've got, say, your drug dealers, then you've got the, the, the high up, high up drug dealers who everyone seems to want to cling to, want to be with. People have got the need to show off. People have got the need to basically show that bigger person what they can do. And then that bigger person may take a life to them, may not. If they don't, they might go out and do something else. What sort of things might a young kid do? All sorts of things. Don't smash someone's house up as a favour. Burn someone's car even. Some people might even go out and kill people. Kill people? Yeah. Really? Just to get that bigger person type of And then to a male, or to be that one to step forward. So you feel the pressure to be dominant? I think that there's something about the, that structure that you describe. It didn't just come out of thin air. No, it didn't. It, I think it comes out of being a man. It's because there's a need in mm. the people involved to have a certain sorts of relationships. So the men involved, they've got certain feelings that they want to put into the situation. So that you know, they, whether they want to show off mm. or whether they want to bully somebody or whether they want to feel the top dog, or whether they want to be show how daring they are, or whatever. And, and the situation has come out of all the people needing to show those. Shoulder. Does that sound right? For all 
its turbulence and trouble, the world of men, Aaron describes, is one of rank and an intense emotional need for status. Now I wanted to know how widely that need was shared. I've come to Skelmersdale in Lancashire to try and understand what the running battle between cops and criminals can tell us about men today and to make art about what I find out. Digmore is one of the town's most crime-ridden estates and a group of its young men showed me around the boundaries of their patch. They're led by an enigmatic figure called Little Kev. So what do you think makes a real man then? Around, around Scrapping here? slad, dude. Scrapping. Uh, hey. Turning up to a fight. Really? Having the fight and then walking away. Who do you look up to? Do you look up to anyone? Well, to be honest, hold my hands up, Tupac, lad. The rapper? Yeah. Is he your hero? Yeah, he's what, what do you like about Tupac? He rides with us four or five. A gun. A gun? Yeah. That's what he does. But is that, is that a good thing? It's not a good thing, but sometimes you have to do it. It takes a it. man to end the life. You'd be on the phone to someone having beef. Yeah. Not all of the Digmore lads were caught up in crime, but they shared a common enemy. The estate across the road, Tan House. <laughs> So do you like Skeb? Yeah, I love it. It's different to anywhere it's else. You go to like Wigan or somewhere, you walk around, everybody's like dead weird about our life. Around here, everybody's sort of the same. OK, so it's, do you think it's weird in Wigan? Yeah, just all different places is weird. Really? Not, not, living in Skem's not where like anywhere else. But not, not the richest people in the world, but everybody gets by. Oh, well. if, I, if I had a tenner and he needed something to eat, I'd get him something to eat. Yeah, yeah. Even though that was my last tenner. Yeah, yeah. No, 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 that doesn't happen nowhere else. Would you say that that kind of honour is a sort of really important thing for you, like looking after each other? Yeah. Yeah, shows the loyalty in the game. In the game? It's just the game. Like, right? you don't prove yourself that it's dying by your mates. You won't get a lot. You'll be a scam for a long time. Why is it that you have such sort of difficulty sometimes with people from other bits of the estate? The difference between us and them we is... Don't sniff. There's a big difference, snitches. like... Yeah. You do speak yeah. different in Thanos. You go to Thanos, you'll notice they'll speak a bit different. But to them... And, and they, wear, they wear, like, the same as clothes. Yeah. But every single one of them had had the clothes for about six yeah. years. And it's just, like, a bit scruffy in that bit, isn't it? So is it important to look smart, then? Yeah. Smart. You know, they're, they're, they probably say the same things about you as you say about them, don't they? Mm, probably, yeah, but... Do they? Yeah, they do, but the difference is we deal with it, they don't. So what were your dads like, you know, what, when you were growing up? You know, and, and sort of... Because, you know, we all, in some ways, we all learn yeah. to be men from our fathers, don't we? So what were your fathers like? A wanker. No, I wasn't really. No way to be seen. Yeah. What, your father? Yeah, yeah. He's a wanker. I'm safe with him. <laughs> I don't like him. Never been there. Yeah. Really. Most like most fucking kids in skin. I'm cutting yeah. for you. Yeah, I've got dads out there, you know what I mean? Like, if you don't know your dad, you've got to make yourself a man, you know what I mean? I'm not rely on no one to help me out. But being, being that kind of person who is very strong, it's admirable, but it also means you cut other people off, don't you? Yeah. Yeah, you do like, but. You learn, you learn as you get older. Like, who's there for you, who's going to help you? Can I take your photo? Because I'm, I'm making artwork, right, so I need my research materials, OK? Because at some point, I'm going to come back up here with my artwork and I'm going to show it to you. Hi, is a bevy, yeah? Yeah, go on then, line up. After talking to those lads, I mean, I'm not going to pretend I wasn't slightly intimidated because, you know, I was loaded up with all the preconceptions about such young men who cover their faces with their hoods and pace about like prowling panthers. In many ways, I think that they hold quite old-fashioned ideas of masculinity. Some of them were kind of quite down on 
deadbeat fathers and things like that. They're, you know, they realise that, you know, a real man, maybe in the, their, the back of their minds, a real man is someone who kind of uh, provides for their family and maybe holds down a regular job and, you know, is there for their children uh, because some of them haven't had that. A lot of them haven't had that. And uh, so, they, you know, when they they have a, a moment of reflection, you can see that they do. They, but at the same time, of course, they all want to be Tupac and uh, shoot each other. And um, but I think that's a pretty thin veneer. Loyalty, honor, pride, and a finely calibrated sense of how they ranked. Strip away the North Face styling and the weed, and I could have been talking to a band of young medieval nobles. Back at the station, Sergeant Matthews mapped out what the rivalry was all about. So where, what is the boundaries of Digmore? If, oh. if you could take me round the boundary of Digmore. This is the Digmore area now, and this is where predominantly all the dealings were going on. As we move north of Digmore, we've got Tannhaus. The way it was built, you've got all pathways going right around the whole of Skelmersdale. And this is where the Digmore crew used to go along this pathway, trying to take out any Tannhaus lad. It was obviously they could intercept, and that's where we had all our stabbings. But that's the difference, that's the mentality, isn't it? We're Digmore, you're Tannhaus. It's like something from Game of Thrones on a very, very small scale. For Sergeant Matthews and his men, the markers of power and status couldn't be clearer. They literally wear them on their sleeves. But with the young men they're policing, it's a muddle to be constantly fought over. Yeah. Just oh. listen to what you say now. And it's intimidating all this, you know. Right, listen, if you start getting arsey or aggressive, you'll go back in cuffs. I'm getting paid, so I can take all day as far as I'm concerned. If it goes into overtime, even better. But for you, the quicker the process, the better. Thanks. I'm sorry. No jewelry on. Danny, from the enemy estate of Tan House, had been swept up by Operation Nemesis for carrying a knife. Meeting him brought home to me how confused these young men were about the values they thought they were fighting for. Hello, I'm Grayson. You're Danny. Hi. What brought you in here today? I carry a knife now, I'm in for my own protection. You keep getting stabbed, getting stabbed, getting stabbed. It's sliced across the face, stabbed in the arm. Stabbing the shoulder. Stabbing. That is scary. No. That, that's why I have to carry a knife around with me. So do you really think you'd use it if you were in, if you were threatened? Yeah. Really? Yeah. If they're running at me with a knife, why can't I use it? I don't know. When I leave my flat in Digmore, I go to Tannhaus every day to look at my area in case anyone comes around that area. So you're patrolling? Yeah, that's what I mean. I'm basically doing what the police should be doing by walking around the tunnels every day, looking after people. In what way do you look after them? Just, just, by, just by walking around and making, keeping an eye out in case anyone's about. If anyone's about, I can just ring someone and say, there's loads of people here. But aren't you then intimidating them in the way that you're intimidated by the people in Digmore? No, I'm in tunnels looking after my own area where I used to live. I never felt like I had to look after where I lived. Why do you feel you have to look after it? Because I've got family and I've got my nan that lives in Tannhaus, I've got my uncle that lives in Tannhaus, I've got my whole family that lives in Tannhaus. Yeah, but then why do you have to look after dad. it? Well, isn't it my job to look after my own mum's house if it's getting smashed up? Or no, it's the police's job to do that. It's, it's mine as well, technically. No, not really. Yeah, I think this technically the police goes and arrests the people. I can't technically walk around with a knife. Yeah, fair yeah. enough. Yeah. It's, I'm just interested that you feel that it's your job to sort of protect your area. Where did that idea come it's from? It's not my job, no. It's just fucking out of my goodness and my heart just to look after people that I, that I fucking like, you know what I mean? And what would you do if they did, someone did damage the cars or the houses? I'd go mental. I'd go mental. You'd go mental? Yeah, I'd go mental. And? Uh, find out who it was. Oh, Danny, Danny. He looks so frail. 
and he has this strange compulsion that seems to be almost in the DNA to sort of protect and family. And it's like something from some very primitive civilization where he's patrolling the borders of the Serengeti or something. And if, even if part of what he was saying is true about the way he, he's, uh, he gets attacked and things, it's frightening. You know? And this is just over a patch of a council estate. You know, it's like a tiny little microcosm. And then you think, you know, explode that out. <laughs> you know, England, ISIS, Russia. <laughs> Sometimes I think it's all the same, it's just different scales. With no clarity about what a man should do, in his mind, Danny was stepping up to the plate. It was the mums of the Digmore estate, Jane, Michelle and Gail, who spelled out the scale of the problem. They could see in their own sons a repeating pattern they felt powerless to stop. What do you think about the, the, the nature of men in this part of the world? In this part of the world, I think they're all a letter. In what way? Because <sighs> there's not one fucking real man is there. What is a real man? Someone that knows how to respect a woman, things like that, with a voting scale. What's a real man? Anyone got an answer to that? <laughs> with my experience, God, no, there's not. I had to go out of STEM to find one, do you know what I mean? What sort of things do, you, do, you, do, do they do to let you down, though? The men on our estates are all in the young. Young lads. Young lads. So all they're doing is vandalising. And causing mayhem because there's nothing else for them to do. And you can see it. We know which who's going to be the next gang. You can see it, haven't you? Oh, you're yeah. going to be no motion. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 And we know from the age of like nine, we know with what kid's going to yeah. be what. You know, you know what kid's going to end up You know what child's going to end up here. Said it myself, said it about my own one, and he did. You, know you mean? can sense it happening. Yeah. yeah. I've got yeah. a nine year old son. Yeah, I've had, I've had to restrain him from getting a knife out of the house, you know, and that's at nine years of age. That's Most right. definitely. It is. My little son frightens me to death. Because that's how the streets have gone nowadays. It wasn't like that uh, years ago. Nowadays, it's all single parents. I am the mum and dad. I mean, I got a Father's Day card on Sunday, which I was... was nice as well, but, like, sad, really, innit? Well, you got a Father's Day card from yeah. your child? Yeah. Say that is quite sad. Say you're my, saying you're my two-in-one, because I am. I'm, I'm their mum and I'm their dad. After talking to the mums, I feel quite affected, actually. And when Jane said that she got the Father's Day card from her child, you know, that really affected me, that fact that they, they know what's happening and yet they don't know how to deal with it, you know, how what to do with it. They had a lot of empathy for the boys because they could see the changes in their children as they are drawn into the sort of vortex of male dysfunction. I got my first idea for an artwork from the way the mums talked about the lads on the estate. Skelmersdale was like a landscape of lost, bewildered maleness in the roar. Once I started to see it that way, there was inspiration to be gathered everywhere I went. When we look at states that have got sort of problems with young men like this. Often I feel that the forces that be, they, they kind of just try to stick a sticking plaster and they don't look at the absolute sort of central issue, which for me is they are men. And a thing that, you know, these lads need, which society isn't giving them for whatever reason, is 
a feeling of, of, of territory, of a feeling of respect, a feeling of status, which they get. And the only way that they, they, they seem to, be, to think that they can get that is to be the kingpin within this tiny little patch of ground. You know, the more sophisticated, the more educated, the higher status we are in terms of society, we can find different ways of doing that. But all men, I think, are linked by this sort of need. I always call it the dog sniffing asses moment. They need to kind of go, you know, how much territory do you command? You know, how good are you within this field? You know, how good an art... You meet two artists, they meet together at an opening, they're going, oh, where, do you, where are you exhibiting at the moment, you know? So I thought, I'm going to make a map. I do love a map. And I'm going to make a map of their territory. The kind of markers that you see everywhere of the graffiti. FTP, fuck the police, you see that around the estate a lot. The literally symbols of male potency in the, the, the phallic thing. You know, you come up across a great big eight-foot phallus spread on the wall. I mean, it, it cannot be more upfront about what this is about. This is, I've got a big cock and I command this street corner. An ordinary corner of an ordinary street in Preston, Lancashire just down the road from Skelmersdale, and the place where 18-year-old John Joe Hyten was stabbed to death. This is the spot where someone died at the hands of a rival gang. The only actual thing that shows where it happened, RIP John Joe written on the wall. His friends have been here. At the time, they set up a shrine. It's since been removed. They've convicted all those that were involved. I think the maximum sentence, one of them got a minimum of 29 years that they'll have to serve. And to... were they young, these people? Yeah. You know, a 19-year-old lad has now gone to jail for 30 years, or 29 years, uh, before he's allowed for, for parole. 29 years, if you can imagine what you've done in 29 years. Yeah, that, that is a very sobering thought. That's my entire art career. They don't think of the consequences. It feels sort of like a game of cowboys and Indians. Like, you know, when I was a kid, it was, it was uh, mods and rockers. You know, it just it feels... But it's the, if without, you know, w with the horrific consequences, it, it just feels odd, you know. If the artworks I was making were going to do John Joe justice, I needed to capture the tragedy as well as the bravado involved. What does a death do to the men it leaves behind? A number of John Joe's friends were now in prison. You've been here before, John. You've been arrested before. One of them was 22-year-old Jordan, who was being brought back into custody for possessing drugs in jail. Right, John, you understand why you're here, what the officer's just said? Yeah, OK. So I need to authorise your detention just to obtain evidence through questioning. All right. Number nine, please. Number nine. <laughs> Hi, Jordan. Hi, yeah, I'm Grayson Perry. We're making a film for Channel 4. I'm an artist. We're just making a film about men, really. But we, I'd really like your opinion, though, just about kind of what it's like to grow up around here and being male. What is in men that means that they end up in places like this? And the man's supposed to be the one that takes care of, of, of his family. We've got, we've got his girlfriend and his, and his kids. But this isn't looking after your kids, is it? Yeah, but if, if at the time, if you've, if you've not got a way of, of supporting your family, you're going to do anything to... You'll go out and do anything to support your family and feed your family at any means necessary. Most people don't do crime. You know, you're quite rare. Yeah, most people don't, yeah, but I do. Think about changing all the time, but how can you change if every time you try to get a job to play? This operation nemesis messes it up. You can't change when these police are on your back. Jordan cast himself as a provider. Um, <laughs> but then I met the woman he claimed to be providing for, his ex-girlfriend, Jade, who had also been arrested 
on suspicion of helping supply contraband to him in jail. She didn't seem that enamoured of his efforts. Hello, Jade. Is it Jade? Hello, Don Grayson. Hi, hi, hi. Like, you've just spoke to them, that's my ex-partner, I've been with him for six years. We've just split up. When I was in that life, it was the worst six years of my life. And I just, I had lost houses, lost cars, lost jobs. And I thought I could help him. I thought if we have a child and that, that might change him. Nope. I've been with him six years and he's probably been out about six months in that time. Really? Yeah, he's in, out, in, out, in, out, constantly since I met him. I met him when he was 16, and I'm nearly 25 now. And what is it, that, do you think, that, you know, particularly draws men into that? What, why is it's it... It's a that? lifestyle, I think. It's like the money they're making. They just do what they want, don't they? I just feel like that's it for them. That's their life. Jail or dead, that is their life. I came here with a lot of the kind of cliches of hoodies, gangs, police, and it's much messier, but also clearer. You know, for all of the social complexities of crime and deprivation and unemployment and education, all these things, it still is a fact that most people that end up in prison are men. for the reasons that are classically male. They're proud, they're strong, they want to do stuff. They have to be the top dog, they won't change, they won't ask for help. And they're young, and they're forever young, in arrested development. I wanted to speak to someone from a different generation. Stewie had spent 20 years of his life in and out of jail. He lost an eye in a claw hammer attack. So he understood all too well where a life of crime can lead. That's, that's going to be faced so often now. Really? Yeah, and get all this sewn away. Oh, God. It's like when you get a boiled egg and it's with a spoon and it get all shatters. That's what they call it, eggshell fracture. Oh, my face fell in here. Ooh. Oh. So. How do you feel about the fact that you've spent a lot of time in jail? It's an experience, don't get me wrong, but I wouldn't have minded just doing it once <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then not doing it again, you know what I mean? Yeah. So what would you say to the young kids now that, you know, maybe like they're 11, 12? The young kids these days, they're horrible. When people's mothers and fathers are scared to go to the shop, on a day, a local shop, which you've been going to for like 20, 30 years, because there's gangs of kids outside them all the time, horrible. Do you think all that posturing, what's underneath that, do you think? A scared person. Someone who's afraid. Someone who's probably afraid of themselves, you know, probably afraid of their own thoughts and feelings. You know? Bit weird. Have you found that yourself? Yeah, yeah. I've done a lot of AM self exploration, me. If I could go back, I swear to God, I'd do things a hell of a lot different. It's all right going and making a grand, but it's not all right when you're sitting there and smoking every penny of it in one day, and then the next day you're having to go and ask your ma for a tenner. It's no life. I'd rather have a job and just have my own little mortgage and things like that, you know, than, than paying your bills. It's like 40 years of age, I only just started paying my own bills. It was a shock, <laughs> a real bad shock. I'm used to, like, everything getting paid for me. You know, even like council tax, what's council tax, you know, what's that for? Do you think, I don't take this wrong, do you think at 40 you found out what it is to be a man? Yeah. It was like something clicked in my head. I mean, it was something. People say life begins at 40, well, hopefully, you know, and I have, I've, I've tried, and I haven't given it a go, like, oh man, I'm trying my best. put his finger on something that no one else had been prepared to admit to me. That behind all the masculine bluster lay some very unmacho feelings, embarrassment and even shame. 
This is a figure, you know, it's ironic. One of the influences that I'm thinking of using in this piece of sculpture are those African power figures, and yet they are this, what I'm making here is a figure of powerlessness, of young men, perhaps, who feel that they have no control over their lives, and so they try to maintain control over their tiny microcosm of their own world and their own small environment. And that's what this is. This is sort of like king of nowhere. I think that's humiliating. We don't often talk about that, about it's humiliating for these young men. You know, they, they, they have their at every roll, at every turn, they've been sort of shamed in a way for being who they are. Now I had to make the two artworks I was planning and then show them to the two groups of men, police and hoodies, who'd inspired them. Quite how they'd react when they saw the work that spelt out what I felt about them was anybody's guess. I'm working on a sculpture inspired by the young men of Skelmersdale and I've given it the title King of Nowhere. One of my favourite sorts of African sculpture are these what they call power figures. Some people call them fetish figures. And of course one of the aspects of these sort of power figures that is most sort of attractive is the fact that people, they kind of honour them. And how they honour them often is to drive nails and knives and blades into them and of course that's exactly the opposite of what happens to these kids. They get knives and nails and blades driven into them, not to honour them or to make some kind of sacrifice or prayer to the to power, but to try and kill them. I'm back in Skelmersdale, making final preparations ahead of exhibiting my works for the first time. But before I can show the locals the art I've made about them, I've got to round them up. I've got, I've got an art exhibition on at the community centre. I wonder if I could just put a poster up in your window for this afternoon. Yeah. Yeah. For the two meat potato pies, two portions of chips, and I'll take. I'll take. Excuse me. Are you around this afternoon? No, I'm not. All oh, right. Okay. Okay. Never mind. It's taken me back to my old days as an artist, you know, having exhibitions where I kind of like dreaded the fact that nobody might turn up, which was a reality sometimes, you know, openings with five people at them. So it's quite chastening. Everything I'd experienced here, the anxieties about status and territory, the very male need for both, I'd try to distill into these works. But if that wasn't what the locals saw, I was going to get taken down a peg or two myself. There was at least one tribe I could rely on turning up, the police. Hello. Hello again. Hello. <laughs> Good to see it's you. It's been again. a while. Good. And this is it. Looking at that now, it's exactly what I see when I'm going round the streets. The amount of stabbings. But you've reflected, obviously, the, the the caps, the logos of the clothing, the armory. These young men will be carrying. It's all there. Uh, but it's you know, it's about the dilemma, I suppose, of young men. Men are brought up not to be vulnerable. You see the thing, and I think that's the thing, is that good relationships come out of being vulnerable. You've got to open up to other people, and they're all terrified of doing that. And so it's really, really sad, really, is that their masculinity is actually stopping them having a good life. You know, they're like that in a gang. 
when they come into custody and they're on their own mm. and they're at the front desk and they're all they're polite, they're well mannered. You wouldn't think butter would melt when they come into custody. They're completely different. Completely yeah. different. Mm. I think it's really good how you've got Billy's likeness on the face. <laughs> 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 He's got the nose you off. You get that <laughs> <laughs> After the police had left, some of the young men who had inspired the artworks appeared with a few friends in tow. Hiya. What's this? Hey, that's uh, Shepard. Shepard. Yeah, uh, I can relate to that. <laughs> <laughs> right, hey, can we keep some of these knives? <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Andy. <laughs> Do you think I've got it right? Yeah, yeah. Except the for the earring, the car. Bit, the you got the car. You got the North Face. And what about the tapestry? <laughs> yeah, and I like this one. <laughs> Look at that. Fuck the police. Yeah, hey, fuck Tannos, lad. Fuck Tannos, dude. Fuck Tannos. Sit. What's with the penises? Well, they're, you know, you're men. Like that long thing. You, you can't get more <laughs> obvious than that, can you? Putting a great big cock on the wall is like saying, you know, it's like, whoa, here I am, we're, we're men. <laughs> These two pieces are kind of, you know, this is a monument to you as men. Yeah. So how do you feel about that? <laughs> you said forgot one thing. What have I forgotten? Joint. A joint, yeah. <laughs> it's true, actually, you're dead right. Yeah. I should have had you as kind of advisor while I was doing it, shouldn't I? <laughs> Finally, Stewie came face to face with the work he'd helped inspire. Stewie. Tottenham. Hello. Come on. Welcome. But here we are. Here's the two pieces of art I've made about the young men of Digmore. Nice. It's like some African thing, isn't it? Yeah, you got it, yeah. Bang on. It's called King of Nowhere. Yeah. King of nowhere, it's nice. Yeah. Should have put some scars across his head. <laughs> <laughs> it's real, you know, let's not pretend. But that's what struck me when I was looking at, you know, the, the sort of things that people use on each other, anything. And this is their, this is the, this is their it's patch. Yeah, man. my hood. Yeah. Does that represent anything to red? Well, it's like, like a blood. sort of blood stain, like yeah. it, cause I wanted it to be like a, because it's, it's a piece of fabric, I wanted it to be so, like... So when you put a body in, roll it up in the yeah. back of a tranny. Exactly. You were a big part of the inspiration for this piece of art. How do you feel now coming round looking at it? It's like looking at me a bit, you know what I mean? <laughs> it is, I mean, he's got to realise. Oh, go. Well, what does it make you feel about yourself? Is it worth it? Was it worth it? I wanted to show for it. Well, apart from scars and stuff. Well, it's, it gets, it's like emotional, like. It is emotional, you know what I mean? Looking at it. You know what I mean? This is a kind of payoff, really, when I see the, the look in people's eyes, when they see, they say, oh, you get it, Grayson, you get it. And that makes me very pleased. What I'm talking about here with these works is masculinity almost at its rawest, at its most primal. The tribes that inspired these works, they would have had a way of dealing with that. And now we live in a place where these young men, they're lost because there isn't a ritual in place, a system where, where the, what they have, where it can go, you know, in its raw form. But they're vibrating with something that I feel inside myself. I'm not interested in going off to Borneo or looking at some exotic Renaissance palace. I want to see it up front and banal, because I think that there's something there that makes it part of me. I feel that I'm making altarpieces to parts of my society that aren't talked about or articulated.